we got some fans that want to ask some questions to Bruce. Our first listener viewer is Jeff in Farmington, New York, who appears to actually be driving in his car as he is about to ask Bruce Dickinson a question. <laughs> <laughs> Drive yeah, safely, you're in, Jeff. Go ahead. Yeah, you're, you're in one of those Teslas with the autopilot on, are you? Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> That'll be my next purchase, Bruce. Yeah. Um, but I couldn't pass up the opportunity. So uh, an honor to talk to you. This is incredible. Appreciate it. Um, my question for you was, what songs or song, at least, that you guys haven't played in a while on tour, um, are you looking at or would you love to put back in the set list for this upcoming tour? Well, actually, the upcoming tour we've got coming up next summer is, is, is the Legacy Tour. So it's going to be the same set list, probably with a few additions. Well, we may, I mean, we may play Riding on the Wall. We might, you know, do Stratego and ah, we might even get around to doing the title cut Senjutsu, but we're not going to be losing any of the, any of the big favorites. So, you know, expect Spitfires and Flamethrowers and, uh, and everything like that. Cause you know, certainly in Europe, that's what people paid for two years ago to go and see this legacy tour. We've got, in, well in excess of a million people to play to, um, and then some. So there will be, I'm, I'm certain, another tour in which we will do some songs that, yeah, we haven't played for a long, long time. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of ways you can, we've got such a repertoire now, there's all kinds of ways you can cut and slice it. I mean, Steve and myself, we, we once discussed, wow, you know, what if we went out and we did a whole set of all the epics, you know, sort of like Alexander the Great, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, you know, just, 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 just epics, you know, like, wow. And we went, yeah, that would be cool. And then you could go back and do a, a different versions of other things as well, like all the, you know, do, do got a number of the beast in its entirety or, you know, so we, there's so many ways you can cut and slice this. And I think, um, right now, it kind of depends on just what the mood of the world is as you approach a summer, a, a summer touring season. So this summer tour coming up, we've already got it go, running through Europe and we've already announced Rock in Rio. It would be great to come back to the USA, frankly. It would be amazing. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if Uncle Joe lets us back in, you know, then uh, it'll, all be, uh, it'll, it'll all be great to get back out there uh, and do some stuff. And then, what are we, then 22 and 23, let's see how the album goes. Because, frankly, we would love to get out and play a bunch of, a bunch of album cuts. And I'm absolutely certain we wouldn't be playing, you know, festivals and, you know, we be playing arenas and uh it would be to people that you know love the album so okay instead of doing three nights you just do one night but you do one night of really compressed tight album stuff we did the book of souls basically uh or no matter of life and death we did it effectively almost in its entirety mm -hmm. um and um we know how successful that was because we came back the next year and uh, goodness me, you know, the ticket sales were through the roof. So although people, a lot of people, a bunch of people got grumpy about it, you know, oh, you know, where's my song? You know, I only want to hit, listen to songs that are 40 years old. Um, and yeah, respect that. But um, there's a lot of people that have grown up with the band since and, and, and would like to hear us do stuff. OK, maybe not everybody, but a significant proportion of our fans would really get off on that. Um, and, uh, you know, some smaller shows and things. It's uh, something we'd like to do, uh, but it just depends on how the world is, you know. Um, I'm hopeful that we, by the time we get to next summer, you know, uh, this pandemic will be behind us um, and we can just get back to doing what we do. The uh, Legacy of the Beast tour that you said you're going to continue was remarkably well received around the world and an incredible show. I got a chance to see it a couple times. Uh, you mentioned doing a set of epics. They're, the last three songs on the new album 
are all over 10 minutes long. <laughs> the yeah, the yeah. majority yeah. of the songs on the record are 7, 8, 10, 12 minutes long. What is it lately with Iron Maiden and the extended long songs? Is it just you guys flexing your prog muscles or uh, how yeah. does that happen? <laughs> no, I think, I mean, I mean, uh, Steve and I are, are, are partially responsible partially irresponsible i mean i did the you know the the, the whole thing about the uh, you know the, the the airship disaster the r101 which you know was god what was that 18 minutes or something crazy and that was basically arranged for an orchestra which at the time we didn't have and um and we also didn't have a pianist because although i played it on piano i mean my piano skills are literally two-fingered plinky plonk you know so although i could compose it on piano uh, i'm damned if i could play it properly on, on piano so we actually had to do it with me playing midi and i'm honestly i'm a rubbish pianist and i would i would have loved to have had a proper pianist playing that with us in the studio but we didn't have one and we were under the pressures of time so i had to do it um but um yeah for the i mean for this album uh yeah steve is a big fan of prog you know uh and as I, as am i and so you know and it, it, I was talking to somebody else about this, about the different bands that we both liked. Um, so he, Steve, for example, a big, big fan of Jethro Tull. I'm also a big fan of Jethro Tull. He loves Passion Play, Thick as a Brick. I'm more Aqualung and the early stuff, you know. So, but nevertheless, we, we both meet in the middle there. Um, he's a big Genesis fan, you know, the Peter Gabriel Genesis uh lamb lies down on broadway he loves all that me i didn't not crazy about genesis but i loved peter gabriel uh, i think it was his third album solo album intruder no self-control scary dark really moody stuff and there was a band called van der graaf generator who were contemporaries of genesis and they were much, in a way they were even a bit more out there than genesis well i loved them you know and i you know borrowed bits of Peter Hamill, their vocalist, vocal style and things. So we both have this prog thing spinning around our heads, along with, you know, Tin Lizzy, Deep Purple, Sabbath. He's a great fan of Nectar and the Scorpions, you know. Um, and then uh, I was funny enough, I was not that crazy about Judas Priest until I toured with them, until I toured with them with Maiden. And indeed, the Scorpions the same. So, uh, you know, I never really got into Priest that much um apart from like sad wings of destiny until i toured with them and then it went wow they, this is they, they do some really cool stuff you know and that was a great album that we toured with them then with them on so so those are all the kind of influences that are you know pinging pinging around that end up with us doing all these great long songs um and i don't mind them because there's he's kind of um i mean some of the stuff i mean like the 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 the, the, the parchment I mean, is is almost like self hypnosis listening to that. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it really is. You know, it's uh, you know, it's like you're getting sleepy. Come well, there's on. a lot, Bruce. There's a lot of moments in those long songs too, where they're instrumental passages. So I would imagine if you play them live for you as the singer, it's a nice break for you because even though you tend to stay out there and run around a bit, you could walk off for five, ten minutes if you wanted to at oh, times. Oh, oh, and and the, and the parchment. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, I'll, I'll be around the, I'll be around the back having a glass of, uh, of uh, non-alcoholic <laughs> water i get a five and a half minute tea break in the middle of uh, in the middle of parchment uh, but then you have to come out and squeeze your nuts uh, afterwards yeah. so uh, you know uh, you, you you pay for it in the end i mean there's a lot of stuff on this album that which is um you know it, it, it's lower in the range but it's compensated for by some stuff which is really like uh you know up there so uh yeah yeah and by the way speaking of jethro tall that love of tall for maiden goes way way back because we all know maiden did a phenomenal version of cross-eyed mary many decades ago and that was the first time we knew about yep. the love of tall um let's bring in james right now and james is uh joining us from saint francis kansas hi james thanks for waiting you are on with bruce dickinson hi eddie hi bruce thank you great honor he Bruce. Did you just say hi, Eddie? Ah, oh, I've got it. That's I'm right. sorry, sorry. I thought you. I thought. I thought I was going to have to have my monster. My monster from its slab began to rise. I've got, yeah. I've got him right here too. That yeah. one's more handsome than me, though. <laughs> right, Bruce. With the plethora of songs from the Iron Maiden catalog, what's your 
favorite to perform live. And is there an air from the band's catalog that you enjoy doing live the most? Uh, well, we haven't done one of the songs I really enjoy doing. And, the, and, and in fact, because I, uh, I keep um, in lockdown, basically, I was just trying to improve my Iron Maiden pinball score. And of course, we got some really cool tracks on the pinball machine, including uh, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which we haven't done for ages. And I just love doing that song. It's the storytelling element of it is genius. And then the breakdown, the moody bit with the, you know, then then into the, the curse it lives on in your eyes. But oh, it just gives me goosebumps just listening, just listening to it and, and thinking, wow, you know, we're going to do that again one day. That's just awesome. So stuff like that. I mean, I'd love to do one or two rarities off of, uh, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd love to do the prisoner again. Uh, Stranger in a Strange Land, stuff like that. You know, I, I like things that have a little bit of a groove to them. Um, so, um, yeah. Do, Bruce, do you like singing anything from the first two records, the two records you weren't on? Do you like doing any of the Diano stuff? Uh, I know you've done some, but do you, and you even re-recorded Wrathchild once. Do you enjoy digging yeah. into that? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, there's some stuff that, uh, I mean, I really like on those records. I mean, I love Prodigal Son. Um, it's fantastic. I mean, if you want to see a kind of a Jethro Tully sort of influence on the early, early Maiden, you know, that. Um, and uh, in particular, I mean, Killers, uh, the track Killers, and Murders in the Room Org, just great, yeah. great, great, great stuff, you know. I mean, it, the, those were the, uh, um, a couple of tracks that I first heard Maiden play live when I was in Samson, uh, which is a band I was in before Maiden, obviously. And we were all playing together in the same, you know, three band bills and stuff like that. And I remember one evening, the first, the first time I ever saw Maiden, they were, we were, we were headlining in this kind of big club. Um, and uh, they were <clears throat> sort of like special guest. And um, so uh, I thought, well, I better go and stand at the back here and, and, and check these guys out, you know? So, you know, there was like two, three hundred people in, 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 in the audience. And then about 10 minutes before Maiden came on, about 500 people walked through the door. And it was and it was just rammed. You know, you could not move. And they came on and did Killers and Murders in the Room Org. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, I mean, I'd never seen up to that point i'd never seen like um deep purple in their heyday you know and stuff so i could only imagine what they did actually they didn't do a whole bunch you know they, they kind of stood around apart from richie but in my head in my head that was maiden were doing kind of what they would have been doing you know and it was that same level of excitement you know anyway then they and i thought wow that's amazing god i'd love to sing, sing for that band and then at the end of the set um 500 people all left <laughs> <laughs> so, and we went, I went, oh, oh, guys, well, uh, I guess we're going on to a uh, kind of half empty hall then. Uh, yeah. Mm, yeah. There's, that's, that, that's food for thought, you know? Yeah. Yeah. First time I saw Maiden was opening for Priest on the Killers tour in New Jersey. And uh, right. I, I had gone to see Priest and I was like, hey, who's this new band? I'll check them out. And same sort of thing. It was like, whoa. And there were some people that were there specifically for Maiden, even at that uh very, very early period. Eddie Trunk here, and we go back to the callers and viewers uh, joining us virtually on Zoom. Next up from Summit, Pennsylvania, we, wel we welcome uh, Doug August to the show. Doug, say hello to Bruce Dickinson. Hey, Bruce, Eddie, thanks for having me, Bruce. Amazing Hi. to talk to you. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, can't wait to hear the rest of the tracks and, uh, and see you guys again on tour. Uh, question for you. What was the most uh, surprising thing that came up from the creative process or the writing process for the new album? And uh, thank you for all the great music. Appreciate oh, it. Well, yeah, thanks. Thanks for thanks for thanks for that, for the compliment. Um, uh, I think we were all we were all blown away when when we did we did writing on the wall um, and Steve goes, oh, I love that. Yeah, he goes up oh, like a bit of. He said, "I like a bit of Cajun music," <laughs> and, 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 the, and 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 I, I mean, you could have like knocked us down with a feather. We we're like a bit of Cajun music. I don't, didn't really think it was Cajun, but yeah, whatever, you know. What I mean, um, and uh, and he said, "No, it's got to be the first track." I went, "Wow, cool, okay," because it was really different for us 
to do that track. I mean, that's as, as close to a classic rock track, which is because it just felt right. It was fun, you know, it was anthemic track, fun, bang, you know. And um, so, yeah, we were kind of pleased with that. But also uh, on the new record, um, in particular, I'm going to, I mean, obviously people single out the guitar players and they've all done amazing jobs uh, on, on the record. But Nico's playing uh, on this record is outstanding because he's just got this groove going down now. And I mean, the title cut, Senjutsu, just starts off uh, just laying down this really dramatic groove and it just rocks solidly. And there's, there's, there's the Maiden Gallops through throughout but it's not kind of uh kind of adolescent maiden gallops it's not like for the sake of it like every song's not like you know um but there's moments in every song when it kicks in and um, by god when it kicks in i mean there's a song called time machine um which is one of my favorites on the record and um there's a there's a there's a part in that song when it just lifts i mean it's like those bits in irish traditional music when you're fiddling away and then it just has this key change and, and everybody just wants to jump up and down and go i'll have another 10 shots i'll have you know whoa you know um and it's that moment and you just I, you just i just see seas of people's heads bobbing up and down when it happens and there's so much stuff like that on the record um uh so yeah it, it, it's it, i think it was writing on the wall um there's moments on it as well so in the um or one of the, the long so there's a few of the intros are really atmospheric i mean will we'll really surprise people i mean they, they honestly you know you will actually think for a moment that you'd stepped into the moody blues in sort of like the you know late 60s and one or two of the intros not for long um but that's the that's kind of where we're going with this, with the colours and things, because we can, you know, uh, and it is taking an audience audience on a little kind of musical exploration. But it's got everything, you know. It's uh, it's not one dimensional. This record. There's a song on the record called "The Parchment" that really jumped yeah. out at me, and that that's almost that's had a that almost had a cashmere like hypnotic vibe to it at times. Yeah. I, I, that was yeah. amazing. And yeah, so, that's so, right. so, it's like, come to me. It's that moment. You know what I mean? It's, you know, it's like having car. It's like having car sitting on your shoulder. Tss, ah, yeah. from the jungle book. You know what I mean? And also a track called Darkest Hour jumped out of me too. And the guitar playing in that is, is brilliant. Oh, and yes, Nico. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. And Nico's performance yeah. throughout the record, just, just incredible as well, as you mentioned. Uh, let's bring Sam from Wyoming, Pennsylvania on with us to ask Bruce a question. Sam, thank you for listening and watching and welcome. Hey, thanks for having thanks. me, guys. This is quite a kick. Bruce, your music's been uh, part of my life for a long thanks. time. Thanks so much for it. Um, my question is, my question is, uh, Maiden has shown throughout the years to have a uh, a tendency to keep producers for a long time. You had the yeah. late great Martin Birch for the first yeah. half of your career. And uh, now since you've rejoined the band in 2000, you guys have sort of settled on mm -hmm. Kevin Shirley. What is it about Kevin that keeps you guys going back to the well? I think he does great work, but I'm just curious to know what specifically is it that keeps you guys going back to Kevin for album after album? Well, Polly, you know, Kevin's, Ke Kevin's a very good producer. He's a very good, knowledgeable, technical producer. But we are difficult to work with. I mean, <laughs> I've... I have never worked with, I, I mean, I haven't worked with that many bands, but I know how a lot of, I've worked with a, you know, a fair number of musicians and I know, you know, in general, how people tend to work. Nobody works like we do. We are definitely a one-off, you know, the, the way things get put together, all the funny little protocols and the little politics within the band, not in a bad way. This is just the way it works. I imagine it's kind of the same in, in the Rolling Stones. I, I imagine the Rolling Stones, uh, it's not like working with anybody else. It's like, you know, it's, 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 what, what are they doing now? It's like, well, they're the Rolling Stones. They always do that on a Thursday, you know, and they've done it for 40, 45 years. They, that's what they do on a Thursday, you know, and nobody, nobody interferes with that, you know, and it, it's the same same with us you know we have all these little eccentricities that that we've and we 
frankly, we couldn't work any, I don't think we could work any other way. I mean, I, I do albums, obviously I've, I've done solo albums and things, you know, working with, with, with Roy and some great musicians. You work in a more kind of traditional way and Adrian's done records and works in a more traditional way. We as a band need to get together and play in a big room and actually make a lot of noise and do, I mean, it's old school stuff. I mean, and when people say, yeah, it's, you know, it's, you're kind of like, you know, dinosaur rock. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's good. It's like, you know, <laughs> yeah. since, and that's not a bad thing. You know, how many dinosaurs are there left in the world? You know, if we, if you're going to be a dinosaur, you want to be a T-Rex, you know, you know, oh, what do you feed a T-Rex? Any, anything it wants, dude, you know, and, and it's kind of like that with being the, being the producer of, of, of Iron Maiden is you are, you're part of the team, but you, you, you've got to play by, you got to play by our rules, you know, and there's a lot of producers. I could, frankly, I couldn't cope. They're not that they're not in, they're not incapable of doing stuff, but they would rapidly come up against a brick wall um, <laughs> with, uh, with, 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 with some of our opinions and practices in the studio, you know, um, so Kevin we, Shirley, we Ke Ke Kevin Shirley, the maiden whisperer. We'll leave it at that. He makes it all yeah. work. Uh, we're yeah. going to get uh, two more quick ones in here because time is running short. So we want to let these last two folks jump in real quick. This is Jorge Ramos, who is in Austin, Texas. Jorge, you're on with Bruce Dickinson. Uh, first of all, thank you, guys. Eddie, Bruce, serious okay. for doing this. I really appreciate it. And my question to Bruce is, what is your opinion about live stream shows and were there ever any discussions within the band to film and have a live stream set to promote the new album? Or do um, you guys only want to play this material live to an audience whenever the industry backs up? Uh, yeah. Um, there was a discussion that lasted about 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> and, we, and we just went, no way. That's, you know, I mean, uh, because um, we're the best one in the world. I mean, first of all, we hate doing videos. I mean, and we hate doing videos, and that's kind of pretending, you know. And to actually go and do a live show without a live audience is the worst of all possible worlds, you know. Uh, so, yeah, we need to feed off that audience, and the audience needs to feed off us. Having us just stand there like glove puppets, you know, uh, pretending. I'm um, sorry, you know, doesn't cut the mustard. It's like having, uh, you know, it's like watching a favorite uh, sports team playing against holograms, you know, and pretending to fall over when they're tackled and stuff like that. It just sucks. Um, so we, we, would, we, would never, we would never do that. And certainly we would never do that and call it, call it Iron Maiden. I mean, I suppose there might be ways in which we could do it uh in little sessions and things like that but even then i'd want an audience you know you, you'd want some human being to play in front of you know not just a laptop you know um, and, and and anyone who's seen an iron maiden show knows how big the audience looms in the whole presentation and the interaction between the band and audience is just a, a huge part of what makes it so special. So I could completely see you having that position. Yeah. I mean, it, it's frankly, it's not, it's just, it's just, un, and the same goes actually for uh, limited capacity shows, you know, so, so saying, uh, Oh yeah, yeah, you can go to it, but you can only have 50% of the people. So you're going to play to a, a half empty hall. So the experience for the audience sucks. Um, the experience for the band sucks and the promoter goes broke. Well, you've got to work really hard to get all those three things in alignment, you know? So just, we, we just got to wait until we can do things as near normal as is acceptable, you know? And I think that's, so, that's coming. No, no question about that. <laughs> final question for Bruce is from Brett. Bruce, Brett wanted to know if you had any plans to do any more solo albums like Accident of Birth or Chemical Wedding uh, with Roy Z, would you like to do solo records in the future? We know that uh, Adrian did a record with Richie Kotzen during the break, and the Maiden guys all do some things sometimes on the side. Would you like to revisit some of that work and do things, uh, do solo records again? Oh, not only would I like to, I mean, I've got, I've got a work in progress right now that's been um, kind of uh, on and off on the back burner for... Uh, well, for three or four years now, um, and basically, I, 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 
since the pandemic happened, I mean, I've had loads of time, but I can't go to America to um, to do it, to finish up the writing for it, start the recording process and do all that stuff. So I'm just waiting for um, uh, Uncle Joe, you know, to uh, let me into uh, America. Yes, I understand completely what you're saying. You were on tour doing uh, speaking shows, I believe, and you contracted COVID. I'm curious overall, how is your health, not just coming off of COVID, but also you, of course, are a cancer survivor. And uh, yep. I'm wondering how, you, how you're doing on that front as well. Is everything continue to be all clear? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a, basically, I'm like a big medical experiment, you know, so <laughs> I'd like at the cancer thing five years ago, nearly six years ago now. Um, and that was, uh, that was three or four months of treatment and which does kick the hell out of your body. But it was a relatively brief bit of chemo uh, in there. Um, so, yeah, I had the, my double shot of vaccine uh, back in May. Um, everything hunky dory, and then I got what people are calling a breakthrough COVID infection, um, which was just like a—it's—it's a, it's a bit more than a flu. I mean, I would really caution against people who go, "Oh, it's just a flu." No, it's not. And I know a lot of people who were not vaccinated, not because they didn't want to be, but they were like too young to get it initially. And you know, 22, 23, 24 year old people who have not been able to get out of bed for six, eight weeks um, after it—they've been really sick. Uh, ongoing, and not in hospital, but their life is really screwed up. Uh, and there's all kinds of lot. There's, there's people talking about sort of like, you know, long-term COVID causing diabetes, causing stuff with your brain, uh, even dare I say it, erectile dysfunction. There you go. They didn't tell you about that when they said go and get vaccinated. There's a really good reason to go and get that because it makes you willy shrivel. Um, because the, the blood vessels with COVID can become really inflamed. So they get blocked up and your extremities don't get enough blood. And obviously there's one extremity which is dear to our hearts as men. And if that doesn't get enough blood, then boy, you're into a world of pain or not. Um, so there's a lot of reasons for me why the vaccine, again, anecdotal, people say, oh yeah, but you still got COVID. I said, yeah, but I'm not in hospital. I got over it in 10 days. It took me about a week after that to get my smell back and to get um, to start feeling more normal, get energy and stuff. But this is not just an ordinary common or garden flu. And uh, uh, honestly, it's my personal opinion. I'm not I'm not forcing anybody to go and do stuff, but um, I would advise anybody to just go ahead and get the vaccine. That's yes, my well, I. I agree. I got it as early. I, get, I agree yeah. with you, and I got it as early as possible. And uh, knock on some wood, I, I've been okay. Final thing. I just remembered this. Uh, I have a good friend that's a filmmaker who told me that there was some discussion of he, of he, that he would be working with you on potentially doing a biopic on your experience in Sarajevo. Can, uh, can you comment on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm. Um, so you might be talking. Are you talking about Sasha? Sasha, yes. Yeah, Sasha. Yeah, Sasha. So Sasha and I uh, have been uh, bouncing ideas around. Funnily enough, um, Sasha also does a lot of work with Kurt Sutter. Uh, and Kurt and I have also been bouncing ideas around. Kurt was the writer of Sons of Anarchy. Yes. Sons of Anarchy. Binge watching Sons of Anarchy was what gave me the idea to have the four bikers of the apocalypse in the video. Um, so uh, it was a real thrill for me to get talking Zoom calls about script writing, screenwriting, and graphic novel writing with Kurt. Um, that might turn up into something on its own anyway at some point. Um, but yeah, Sasha and I have been, I've kind of timelined um, a, the story of the trip into Sarajevo. Um, in which I have to say, it's not really a biopic of about me. Uh, I'm the excuse for making the film about the, the overall environment. It's an incredible story, but the people who are involved on the periphery and uh, central to it in Sarajevo itself, uh, their stories are uh, more, I, th I think, more interesting um so yeah i i'd be in it not as me i have to get somebody else to go and play me i don't know who <laughs> we'll figure out somebody um 
but um, yeah, the uh, it, it is a, it is a great it is a great story, and and we've already got quite a way round down to to kind of mapping it out. But we haven't physically um, started uh, page one of a script yet. Yeah, Sasha did the film, the Anvil film, and many others, and uh, he he was mentioning to me that uh, about it. And for people that don't know, there's a fantastic documentary that you did that came out a number of years ago about that experience, but this would actually be a biopic. The documentary yeah. on it already exists. Well, Screen for Me Sarajevo was the, was the documentary that was made um, actually by people in Sarajevo um, themselves off their own, you know, off their own bat. There's a local documentary uh, filmmaker called, um, well, he's a filmmaker uh, called um, um, Adnan. The first thing I heard about it was when um, somebody came into my local pub with a laptop and showed me the raw footage of some of the interviews that they'd done with people 20 years after the event. And basically it was people saying how much the event had changed their lives, changed their attitude, changed their lives, changed their opinion about humanity. I mean, it was, it was heartwarming and amazing stuff to hear. And, um, so they they said you know would you like to be involved i said well anything i can do to help but it's not my it's not my documentary it's it's your documentary uh, honestly they did an incredible job we were unfortunately it suffered from being the timing of it we were late for things like um sundance and all these festivals uh it was it was too late to get in for a lot of those festivals which uh uh, it was very unfortunate because now people have rediscovered it and gone, wow, we never knew about this. It's it's just, it's really, you know, sad, but it's it's out there. And, um, you know, if people want to go and watch it, it's uh, it, it's well worth watching. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And hopefully it does become a biopic. That would be really interesting to see. Uh, everybody check out the new album from Iron Maiden, Senjutsu. It is a double studio record of all new material. And it is out uh, on September 3rd or now, depending upon when you're hearing this. We look forward to hopefully getting some Maiden shows here in the U.S., Bruce. It's always a treat when you guys come over. Like you said, hopefully uh, Uncle Joe will <laughs> will allow it. And uh, Uncle Joe, that, I have to stop calling you Uncle Joe because that's uh, Stalin, isn't it? That was his nickname. <laughs> you know. uh, but thank you so much for the time and, and for doing this. Hopefully we'll see you in the States soon. And congrats on the new record. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, that was a lot of fun. Thanks to the audience that called in. And, of course, thanks to Bruce Dickinson. And check out the new Iron Maiden album, which is out now. And, again, video of that entire conversation is available for SiriusXM subscribers on the SiriusXM app.